The Gloriana Set by Theobald Moon Chapter 19 Recovery Marnie halted outside Infirmary's main door and unfolded Harry's marauder's map. I solemnly swear I am up to no good, she whispered, tapping the parchment with her wand. Malfoy's was the only dot in the infirmary. Madame Pomfrey stood was in her office just off the main ward. Hermione crept in cautiously, wishing she could light her wand, but infirmary was now protected by wards preventing non-medical spells. Hermione proved of the security measures as inconvenient as they were now. She slipped from room to room, feeling her way in the near darkness until she reached the main ward. The only light was a thin yellow line shining under Pomfrey's closed office door and the moonlight pouring onto the ward's single patient from the wide east window. She crept to Malfoy's bed, her trainers making no sound on the stained floor. Malfoy lay stretched out, looking impossibly long on the narrow bed. He was asleep, but the thin blankets were twisted around his middle and one pyjama-clad leg and bare foot stuck out. The other leg was wrapped in bandages, as were both his arms. His face looked peaceful, though free of pain, his hair rougher. A fallen angel crashed to earth. Hermione shook her head and sat down in the chair by the bed, banishing the ridiculous thought. There was nothing angelic about Draco Malfoy, quite the opposite. A silver vessel he was, shining on the outside, empty inside. That will be the man, she told herself, thinking of Astoria. Pure blood redemption, that will be his life. She didn't know how long she sat there, lost in gloomy imaginings, when she heard a low, hoarse voice. Granger. Hermione leaned over to speak into his ear. Quiet, she said softly. Pomfrey's in her office. Malfoy tilted his head slightly to look up at her, eyes shining. From the pain potion, most likely. Come to nurse me, Granger. Hermione said nothing, just moved to pour water from a pitcher into a tin cup. She held the cup up to him, but he shook his head. Granger, he whispered. She bent forward again to hear him better a long curly lock of hair dropping to his shoulders. He smiled tightly. I can't move my arms, nurse. Hermione nodded and stood, swiping a pillow from a nearby bed. She placed a hand under his neck, gently raising him and placing the pillow beneath. Then she slid her hand out of that warm skin and silky hair and picked up the cup again, putting it against his lips. His eyes held hers intently as he drank, but she was pleased to see that her hand remained steady. How bad is it? She asked, bending towards his ear once more, her hair tumbling forward. Malfoy tried to shrug his shoulders. Could have been worse. No head injuries. The skellig row is just about finished. Thank Merlin. He went slightly. Good, she whispered. She straightened absently, smoothing Malfoy's hair back from his forehead as she eyed his bandages more closely. The right arm wrapping looked a little loose. She turned his head, lips brushing the side of her wrist. And Hermione couldn't suppress a small shiver. She glanced back at Pomfrey's office and pulled her hand away. Tell me about the threats, she said, looking down at him. He sighed. There is nothing to say. You were warning me this morning. You knew you would be attacked. Yes, and you didn't listen at all, did you? He asked, his voice rising. Astoria told me about those choking hexes. That was you. I know it. Shh, Hermione hissed. She bent over him again and her hair fell onto his shoulder, creating a wall around their face. She pulled the curls behind her ear impatiently, but it just fell forward again. Malfoy's eyes closed. Don't go to sleep, Malfoy. Oh, I'm anything but asleep. He growled, but he kept his voice low. Nobody knows who hexed those beaters, she said. He snickered softly. Really? And how many students can cast two simultaneous choking hexes from forty to fifty feet away? Merlin, Granger, you'll get yourself expelled if you keep on like this. Hermione puffed a laugh into his ear. You're lecturing me on prudence. You'll get yourself killed if you keep on like this. You've been getting death threats, haven't you? He shrugged again. Nothing new. A few weeks into school and you're an infirmary, Malfoy. That's new. At this rate, you won't make it to your nudes, even if you have porn to help you. His eyes widened. Even if I have what? She blushed. Never mind, listen. Malfoy, you have to tell McGonagall about the death threats. If you don't, I will. You are not to interfere. Shh! Hermione straightened and looked over at Pomfrey's office. She thought she saw a shadow under the door. She had silently for a moment, then once again sat in the chair, edging it closer to the bed and leaning over to speak in his ear again. Your ranger, don't tell McGonagall you can't get involved. He whispered, 
before she could say anything. If anyone finds out, you, Hextos Beaters, you'll be next. I'm already a target, she said. Die mudbloods, remember? Damn it, Granger, you need to back off, he hissed in her ear. Since when have I ever backed off? She hissed back, ready to say more, but she was leaning too close now. Malfoy turned his hat to answer, and her lips inadvertently swept along the side of his face, following the sharp, smooth curve of his cheekbone and over the rough, nearly invisible stubble on his jaw. Her eyes closed after her own volition, and she couldn't resist running her lips over his jaw a second time. Merlin, the way he smelled. Don't stop, Malfoy said, his voice hoarse again. She didn't, she couldn't. Just trailed her mouth under that pointed jaw, across the roughness to a smooth spot below his ear. Her fingers were in his hair again, tilting his head back, exposing that long, pale throat, and she could taste his skin with her tongue, feel his rapid pulse under her lips. Pomfrey's office door rattled and Hermione set up, startled. A shadow clearly moved under the door this time. Now you back off? Malfoy sighed. I have to go, she whispered, keeping a wary distance from his ear this time. Ma, this isn't over. You are in danger. This is a Slytherin issue, and we Slytherins will handle it. He was back furiously. Astoria has already. Hermione stood up so suddenly that her chair fell over with a clatter. Of course, of course, Astoria had multiple interests in this. Pomfrey's office door opened, flooding the ward with yellow light. Mr. Malfoy, the matron called. Good Granger, he asked. Hermione. Hermione turned and slid into the shadows, following the far wall to exit the ward. Pomfrey stood at the doorway to her office, blocking much of the light, but Hermione could still see Malfoy struggling to move, his eyes glittering like a cat's in the dark. There is nothing for you to worry about, he called out, his tone significant. Hermione disagreed. There was every reason to worry, but perhaps she had no right. She slipped through the infirmary like a shadow, stopping only to place a few wards on the infirmary door. If she could slip inside, so could someone else. Then it was a long walk back to Gryffindor Tower, silently scolding herself over her behaviour. Never didn't need any help. Some Slytherins did take care of their own. Marnie spent Sunday morning in the Gryffindor common room, grimly working through her assignment with an equally quiet Neville and Ginny. By tactic agreement, no one spoke about Quidditch or Malfoy or choking hexes. Hermione's mind kept wandering from arithmancy however, continuing to dwell on her stupidity the night before. What had possessed her to visit Malfoy? She'd accomplished nothing, and worse, practically attacked the man. Ron's voice echoed in her mind. He's more than a get, he's dangerous, and you talk about him like he's some kind of wounded bird. Ah, oh, yes, the Florence Nightingale effect, that explained it. Malfoy looked so winsome and vulnerable, at least when he wasn't talking. All ruffled hair and big eyes. It was a passing weakness, a misplaced saviour complex, a law for justice. Hermione nodded in satisfaction and tapped her arithmancy figures with her wand, watching them shift. That afternoon, she went hiking with Hagrid in the Forbidden Forest, enjoying the still fine weather and gathering herbs for the blood potion. Hagrid was an excellent company, finding dark hollows full of bloodroot, talking about his new shipment of moon lynxes, and didn't mention Quidditch either. The rest of the school was still obsessed with Sunday's match, however, eager to hash over Malfoy's injury and the hex beaters at breakfast Monday morning. Astoria had kicked the two beaters off the team, Seamus said, and they had detention until Christmas. Malfoy was openly welcomed at a Slytherin table, moving a little stiffly, but otherwise the picture of health, while the two beaters wore bandages around their necks and moaned pitifully. Malfoy was obviously irritated by this side, which amused Hermione, who hadn't forgotten the blonde's malingering over his hippogriff wound in third year. But her smile wavered at the sight of Astoria sitting by Malfoy, her hand stroking his arm, and Pansy Parkinson on his other side pouring pumpkin juice. Hermione, you need to stop glaring at Malfoy, Neville whispered. McGonagall is watching. Well, make up your mind, Neville, she snapped, keeping her voice loyal. Am I supposed to hate him or not? She stuffed a book into her bag. I guess all I can do is leap. She swung her leg over the bench and stomped out of the great hall. To cap off her mature behaviour, she went and hid in the bathroom until just before ancient ruins. Malfoy kept eyeing her throughout class, but didn't try to speak to her, and when they stood opposite each other in patience, 
he went about mincing his squid suckers as if he'd never had a death threat in his life. Ren kept throwing resentful glances at Malfoy across the table, but said nothing, and Hermione and Lavender exchanged relieved looks. Slaghorn had them mixing up another draught of peace, with an eye to creating a few healing potions, and that suited everyone's mood. Most Granger, Mr. Malfoy, could you stay a bit after class? Slaghorn asked as he visited their table. Ron narrowed his eyes suspiciously, but again said nothing. Maybe the heavy steam bellowing from their cauldrons was having an effect. Hermione could literally feel her head bend right from her skull as her hair expanded in all directions. After the class ended, Hermione and Malfoy sat on each side of their empty table in silence as they waited for the professor. Malfoy began drawing invisible patterns on the tabletop with a single elegant finger. Hermione's eyes couldn't help tracking the movement, and Malfoy must have noticed because he lifted his hand, waggling his fingers at her in a little wave. Hermione flushed and looked away. How are you feeling? She asked politely. Quite well, thank you, he said, amused. We still need more ingredients for our blood patient, she said, pulling a scroll out of her bag and knocking out two others. Malfoy picked up the nearest rolled-up scroll, looking at outside markings. Porn, he asked, raising an eyebrow there. Why, Granger, I didn't know you like that sort of. It's a club, she said, snatching it away from him. A porn club? A study club. You study porn? Malfoy was smiling now. How interesting. Need another member? She scooped up all the scrolls and stuffed them into her bag. You're disgusting. I'm not the one starting porn clubs. Miss Granger, Miss Malfoy. Slughorn boomed. Money jumped in her seat, trying not to blush. I wanted to ask you both about Friday night. I'm resuming my little gatherings this year and... The professor netted on and Hermione was suddenly too indignant to feel embarrassed. Sakran had made her stay after potions, stuck her alone with Malfoy while her hair staged an anti hairband revolt. Ugh, why did she even care? Plus, made her late to arithmancy just so he could talk about his Godric damned slug club. Well, Miss Granger? Slughorn and Malfoy were looking at her. We simply couldn't hold it without you. I know you're quite busy. Yes, very busy, Malfoy put in. She's starting a new study group. Do tell, Slughorn said to her, all eagerness. It's an eighth year into house group, Hermione said, trying not to blush again. The first meeting is Wednesday after dinner at... Oh, we don't have a place yet. I would like to offer the patient's dungeon, Slughorn said. Just say, shrivel fix and the door will open. A dungeon, Alpha said brightly. Perfect. Now about Friday, Miss Granger, Slughorn said. I know it's your birthday, so if you have other plans, I'll be happy to choose another night. Hermione blinked. She'd forgotten why she was sitting here stuck on a Malfoy in the first place. Why day's your birthday, Granger? Malfoy asked. She nodded, trying not to glare at Slughorn. She shouldn't be surprised that the professor knew. He probably had doses of all of his favorites. So Friday night would be acceptable, Slughorn pressed. Hermione tried to come up with an excuse, but her mind was blank, so she just nodded. Splendid. It would be a nice little affair. The professor looked up at the wall. Heavens, you both will be late to your next class. He waved a wand and two small scrolls appeared on the table. Here are notes for your professor, uh, Mr. Malfoy, if I could have an additional word. Hermione picked up a note, hoping Slughorn hadn't written, but he kept her behind to discuss his slug club. Professor Vector would not be amused. She slung her back over her shoulder and left the patient's dungeon in a half daze, not even coming back to herself until she was halfway on the stairs to arithmetic. What had just happened? Despite its acronym, few eighth years appeared interested in the people organization for reviewing nudes. While the Ravenclaws and Hufflepuff knew porn's true purpose, the Slytherins were allowed to make what Ginny called unwarranted assumptions that neither she nor Hermione felt inclined to correct. The you came the closest to the truth as they sat together in a large windowsill Tuesday after defense against the Dark Arts. Oh, I hear you're starting a porn club, he said with a smile. It's called P-O-R-N, she admitted. His green eyes narrowed, and for a moment he looked so much like Harry. What's the catch? She grinned at him. Come and see. Tomorrow after dinner in the patient's dungeon. I will, he promised, reaching out a hand to take hers. Sam was broad and soft, and he wore a silver signet ring embossed with an N. He laced his fingers through hers, looking down at the connected hands, then up at her face. And his eyes didn't look like Harry's anymore. I'd like to take you to Hogsmeade Friday night, he said quietly. She shook her head. I'm sorry, Slughorn's having a supper party. The Slug Club is back, eh? 
Theo's mouth twisted slightly. He obviously hadn't received an invitation. Hermione wished she could give him hers. I'd rather not go, but... And on Saturday, Theo asked, Ron and I are meeting Harry in Hogsmeade. He looked at their intertwined hands and impulsively said, But not until four o'clock. Now, that sounds promising. I could meet you at... Tames and Scrolls, she asked. The bookshop? Why aren't I surprised? His voice was amused. Meet at one. Hermione nodded and Theo gave her hand a light squeeze before releasing it. I have to go to Transfiguration, he said. McGonagall is giving me a makeup test. Non-sentient to sentient, she asked. Yes, Theo said. He slid out of the window sill, bending to give her a light kiss on the cheek, then shouldered his back and walked off. She stood there, watching him turn the corner, wondering how he always knew the perfect moment to leave. Hermione arrived early on Wednesday evening for the pupils' organization for reviewing Newt's first meeting, looking over her six-foot scroll, breaking down the exams into 47 sections. Most of her classes were well enough, but she didn't trust any teacher except McGonagall to prepare properly for the most significant exam of her academic career. Her future was at stake here. She wasn't running around in a pleated skirt and striped tie at age 18, almost 19, out of nostalgia. Eighth-year students began to trickle into the room, with an expectant pack of Slytherin men arriving at the last minute. The young Blaze took seats in front, while Marvel leaned against a stone pillar with the look of a man prepared to be entertained. They took the news that Hermione's porn study group was an actual academic club fairly well, except for Greg Goyle, who looked devastated. Oh, what materials! He said loudly, and the entire room nearly cried with laughter. I'm so sorry to disappoint, Hermione said, unable to hide her grin. Then she launched into a little speech. Think of studying as a quest. As you begin your nude studies, you are going into the unknown. She was pleased that nearly everyone stayed till the end although looking a little glum. Oh, I'll be speaking to Ginevra about this, Blaise told Hermione afterwards. I believe she is starting her own group for the seventh years, Hermione said, the Society for Magical Understanding of Tests. Hermione and Malfoy met in the patient's lab early Thursday morning to brew a tiny test sample of the patient. But without a clover, the smell drove them out of the small room even before they'd added a troll's blood. We'll try again Saturday morning, Malfoy said, gagging delicately as they leaned against the wall outside the potion's dungeons. We need six bushels of clover blossoms, Hermione pointed out. I'm on it. Uh, how are you, Granger? Now if I turn to look her in the eye. Oh, I said I'm on it. What six bushels? He sighed. A little trust, Granger. Other people can be resourceful too. I can help you today before dinner. No, I have plans and they don't involve mucking around hillsides picking flowers, Malfoy said firmly. Back off. Hermione huffed. Fine. He edged closer, his expression changing. Oh, unless you'd rather not back off. Malfoy glanced around the corridor. We should keep our voices down, he whispered. No, we should talk loudly, Hermione boomed out. My knee's a little sore, nurse. He murmured, his breath warm on her ear. Could you? Hermione pushed herself away from the wall, slinging her back over her shoulder. Talk to me when you have the clover, she said, then walked quickly towards the stairs before she did something stupid again. Obviously, a career as a healer was out of the question. Their patient's rancid smell ended up seeping into the main patient's dungeon, and Slughorn set the advanced class to bring the loft patient Amortensia to counteract it. Unfortunately, the smell of rotting meat combined with people's favorite scent just made matters worse. Slughorn started out asking people what they smelled, but the combinations were so revolting. Honeysuckle and dead pigs? He gave it up and dismissed them an hour early. Hermione was enormously relieved. The last thing she wanted to do was tell the entire class about the mingled scent of two separate brands of expensive cologne wafting from her cauldron, as well as Oh the Butcher's Shop. Both Ron and Malfa kept glancing at her and glaring at each other, and she didn't want to hear what they smelled either. At least Malfoy was in defense against the dark arts that afternoon, which made education more pleasant for everyone. Bluebell had them discussing complementary dark and light magic, a cursing versus a healing spell, for example, and there were no snide remarks on near duels. Theo tried his best to annoy Ron, but his smiles and significant looks at Hermione didn't set off the visceral reaction that Malfoy could elicit with the slightest of glances. Hermione and Ron were partners again for the practical portion of the class, and it was nice to use her wand in a non-aggressive way. She discovered the reason for Malfoy's absence while leaving the North Tower. 
He was walking along the battlements with his mother, who was visiting again. In her deep blue velvet cloak with embroidered silver stars, Narcissa made Astoria look like a kid in pigtails. Malfoy looked very lord of the manor himself, his posture at his haughtiest. Hermione hunched and tried to slip by unnoticed, creeping along the opposite wall, but to no avail. Miss Granger, Narcissa Malfoy said, her soft voice full of command. Lady Malfoy, Hermione said, straightening. Welcome back to Hogwarts. She glanced at the blonde man beside his mother. Malfoy? Narcissa bowed her head a fraction. My son says you have been quite cordial to him upon his return to school. I am grateful. Not for the first time, Hermione wished she could raise one eyebrow, the only appropriate response to a description of her and Malfoy's checkered relations this year as cordial. She just smiled again. We are trying to make a fresh start, Lady Malfoy. Not everyone has your generosity of heart, Narcissa said. Her blue eyes were penetrating. Hermione clutched the wand in her pocket to keep from rubbing the scars on her arms hidden under her robes. My entire family must beg your forgiveness for past events. Of course, Hermione said, her teeth gritted slightly. One must look forward. Mother, Malfoy said quietly, perhaps we should go inside. Nonsense, Narcissa answered without taking her eyes off Hermione. Madame Pomfrey said you must walk every day, Draco, and walk you shall. A shocking injury, wasn't it, Miss Granger? Yes. Hermione turned to Malfoy, trying to match his cool bearing. I hope your recovery has gone well. It has. The nursing was excellent. His voice held a hint of suggestion, but Hermione managed not to blush. I am a frozen pond in Norway in sub-zero temperatures. Draco tells me you are his partner in potions. Narcissa continued. Yes, Hermione said again. An awkward silence fell and she felt compelled to add, he has done some remarkable work. But you continue at the top of your class as usual, Miss Granger. The term has just begun, Hermione says. He has time to catch up. She kind of liked us talking about Malfoy as if he wasn't there. He looked a little irritated now. Yes, it is very important you do well in your newts, Draco. Narcissa lectured her son. I agree, Malfoy said. I attended a new study group yesterday. How very interesting, Narcissa said. Not quite as interesting as I had hoped, Malfoy said. Will you be joining us in the Great Hall for dinner, Lady Malfoy? Hermione asked to change the subject. Malfoy smiled mockingly. Sadly, no. I came only to reassure myself as to my son's condition and bring a few items from home. Hermione recalled the huge bundle of treats and gifts Malfoy had received by owls over the years. Jelly slugs, perhaps? Narcissa laughed outright. Oh, I had forgotten. He loved those so. She smiled fondly. No, today I deliver something infinitely more precious. Her smile widened as she looked at her son, and Malfoy's face suddenly lost all expression. I hope to hear some happy news soon. Mother, why don't we continue our walk? Malfoy asked quickly. I'm sure Granger needs to get to the library. Will you join us? Narcissa asked Hermione politely. Hermione did her best not to look appalled by the very idea. No, thank you, Lady Malfoy. Your son is correct. I am headed to the library, she gave Narcissa another smile. It was a pleasure talking to you. The pleasure is all ours, isn't it, Draco? Narcissa asked. Oh, yes, pleasure, Murpher said with a suggestive glint in his eyes. Have a good day, Hermione said in her best fake bright voice and walked away as quickly as she could without looking rude. Entering the tower, Hermione leaned against the wall for a minute to recover. She hoped her patient's partner managed to avoid another injury in the future. One Malfoy in the castle was enough. To be continued. Thank you for listening to The Gloriana Set by Theba Moon, read by Ella Max Mabella. If you would like to stay up to date on upcoming chapters and stories, you can follow me on AO3, YouTube or Spotify.